Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nicholas Investment Insights. This week our focus shifts to the future of energy. Faced with enormous pressure from the discovery of global warming over the last few decades, the question of how mankind sources its energy has become a paramount decision in both political choices and, more importantly, the sustainability of human life on the planet. As alternative energy sources to the incumbent high emission methods have emerged over the last 30 years, an entirely new sector has evolved, determined to solve both the financial and technological hurdles to help bring reliable, safe and inexpensive energy to the masses. Today we review how far these advances have come and then look to the potential difference, pun intended, that an abundance of cheap, renewable energy can have on economies and manufacturing, particularly in Australia. To share his experiences and views on this exciting part of the world, we are very lucky to have friend of the show, David Morgan, joining us live from glorious Perth. After working in the oil and gas industry for 18 years, David is now the founder and CEO of Perth-based clean energy construction company, Iron Matrix, who are leaders in bringing environmentally sustainable, energy positive buildings to the mainstream. He has also recently released a book, Energy Wealthy, that presents a clear, logical and sustainable path to a brighter future. David Morgan, welcome back to Nucleus Investment Insights. Hello, Tim. Thank you very much for having me. Great to have you on. Almost exactly a year since we uh, we last had you on the show as well. So I know. Very... Unbelievable that all that time has gone, but things have changed. Can't wait to hear about them. Uh, and also here to share his views on the future of renewables and how they can present investment opportunities, I'm joined by Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hello to you, Damien. Hi, Tim. Great stuff. And just a quick reminder that before we get started to, uh, to, to subscribe, sorry, on YouTube and to click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. And if you've got a moment, feel free to click like on the video now to help our show grow. And of course, for those listening in live, feel free to drop in your questions in the chat box at the YouTube comments box to have them answered along the way. So let's jump into the agenda for today. So we're going to kick off with a look at Australian manufacturing and we have an Australian manufacturer on the line. So that'll be a great place to start. Uh, we'll then be looking at energy cost background, having a look at energy cost implications and then wrapping all this up, of course, as we do uh, in, in quite an involved uh, investment outlook uh, on how we use these themes every day here at Nucleus Wealth. So uh, with no further ado, we'll jump into Australian manufacturing. And I thought I might hand over to David just to uh, give us a quick uh, bit of background, I guess, essentially on, on Iron Matrix, if you like, mate, and, and maybe a bit of an update on what you've been up to in the last year or so. Good one, yes, uh, more than happy to. So uh, yeah, in a nutshell, Iron Matrix is a modular steel construction technology. Uh, it allows anyone to make buildings out of solar panels. Uh, the mission for the company is actually to be able to generate, store and deliver the lowest cost energy on the planet. And we we achieve that by through a real fanatical focus on, on energy. We look to maximize the amount of energy we generate while we minimize the energy we use. So uh, to that end, Iron Matrix is a, is a structure that was designed specifically to be entirely covered in standard solar panels. Um, not only that, but they've been designed to be made by robots, uh, flat packed for transport and can be assembled by as few as two people without any crane scaffolding or earthworks. Uh, yeah, in the last couple of uh, months and really couple of years, we've been focused on the production. So the robot side of that and in that time, solar and batteries has continued to drop. Uh, and basically what that means is that we've got a construction system now where you can effectively create a building clad entirely in solar panels and it can pay for itself over its life. Uh, and this was really the, uh, the goal of Iron Matrix and with our most recent project with a full solar roof, we've actually managed to, to kind of crack that nut. And that, that was really the goal when I left oil and gas was to see if it would be possible. And I, even I would have suggested that was very hard to believe a decade ago. Uh, to be able to generate, store and deliver a unit of energy cheaper than fossil fuels. That's a, it's a huge achievement, mate, and well done. And Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I guess um, from, a, from a manufacturing point of view, uh, what are you doing differently there? Yeah, so the, this was always part of the, the, the value proposition. And, um, you know, uh, mid-2000s, I was working in a Korean shipyard and uh, 
the Koreans were starting to use a lot of robots in their welding. Uh, long seam welds would be done by these automated tractors and people would lay them down and basically they would do this work for them. And it, it struck me that this was going to be a trend and, and I couldn't see any reason why things weren't going to become more automated. And structural steel is actually something that's typically done manually. So yeah, we always, uh, we design the parts for Iron Matrix specifically to be made by uh, cheap, low-cost robots. Uh, the cost of the components to be able to uh, make the, the robots and the, the automated equipment uh, has just been getting uh, lower and lower. Uh, a lot of this stuff, ironically, is, is all made out of China uh, for cents on the dollar compared to where it was five, ten years ago. Uh, and what this means now is that we can actually bring all of these components together We've designed our parts specifically to be made by robots, so it's straight line welds, uh, fillet welds and butt welds, punches and cuts. Um, and what it basically means is that we can produce our components here using Australian steel with robots here in Western Australia, and we can produce those cheaper than China. That's, that's remarkable. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's and so that's where we want to start with this whole thing is, and just for for readers, you know, the reason for getting David on um, is uh, is that not only is he involved in the manufacturing side and the automation side, which we're very interested, in, but but we'll get to the energy bit a little bit later that we've discussed a few times. But I want to sort of focus in on this whole manufacturing thought because, and and and, and I guess acknowledging as well that um, you know, I guess David's. Um, you know, only one data point in this, and and he's also um, you know at the forefront. I think in terms of the uh, the technological sort of edge. So so this does it doesn't reflect every country com company, but it is showing um, where we're going, and we do think there's going to be a real focus on on this over the next few years. As you know, we just saw yesterday, China um, you know putting a whole bunch more constraints on on what uh, imports can go into. Um, uh, into China, and and I think there will be very much this whole focus on well, what you know is it what what is there that we can produce here that we don't need to produce in China anymore, um, as yeah. as our, our country is sort of you know take take a, a further step apart. So so do you want to just talk around, David? You know, we've we've spoken sort of separately, but um, you know the the cost of these robots and and so um, and and sort of the the premises you have and, and things like that. So so for somebody, I guess in in a in an ordinary industry, another another yeah. industry that sort of might be sort of similar. So yeah. the robots you've got, they're not specialists just to you, are they? They're, they're, they're robots that can be adapted to other um, other sort of manufacturing processes. So the, the key element is actually the uh, stepper motors and micro process control units. So uh, the technology lays in a motor that, that you can step um, in small increments to a point and it accelerates and decelerates uh, as you program it to do so. That rotational movement then can be translated into lateral movement. Uh, and then really it's just a question of designing the robot in a way that suits your purpose. If you can control that movement with a high degree of accuracy, then you can effectively get anything to do a repeating process. And this is the real key with uh, what I think manufacturing will also evolve because we will start to manufacture and design products that are specifically made for robots rather than human beings. And it used to be that we would design, like a, a car is a, is a fantastic example. Uh, that was originally designed and people would have uh, spot welded and hand welded uh, components and put things in together uh, to, to, to bring it together. The uh, And then we got robots and they had to be quite complex, six axis, quite expensive, you pay at least you know, quarter of a million dollars for a decent ABB six axis robot. That's before you've actually put it in and integrated it. Uh, so we've got these complex robots that then do this task. What I think, and it's a great example, the Cybertruck, for instance, uh, it looks ugly, but if you actually have a look at the way they've designed that truck, it is purely on the basis of how is it that we can manufacture uh, this component in a new way that doesn't require human intervention during the process. And that's that's what they're betting on and that's how they're intending to get a strategic advantage uh, with that with that truck. So I think that's the, the components um, in terms of cost as well. So those stepper motors, they're literally less than $100 and, and they will last for years and years. And the microprocessor control units, uh, you can 
pay uh, you know twenty thirty dollars for these, and you can control it with almost anything now. You know, like a, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino is enough for you <laughs> to be able to actually rapid prototype and work out how it is that you're going to 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 develop automation in order to achieve what you're looking to achieve. So the 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 cost of the elements is really low, uh, but the real, the, the, the thinking, the hard part is actually designing a product and then designing the robot, uh, the integration of those components in order to be able to manufacture it in a way where you can get speed and efficiency and quality. Mm. So, so if you're replacing one of the robots in your process at the moment, yep. what do you think you're up for? So given uh, you've already designed yep. it and all that type of stuff already? Yep, um, less than $3,000. Right. It's now crazy. it took us it took us six months to come up with that robot the first time, um, so there was a lot of a lot of thought that go went into it, and of course uh, reliability is key, and there's a lot of testing. Uh, but yeah, once you once you actually work it out, the the information becomes known, right? The, and the repeatability of that is is extremely easy. It is actually the nutting it out and trying to work out how these things are going to be integrated and how it's going to work. And of course, nothing in practice works as, as it does in your mind. Uh, all of these things get done on a CAD drawing. And then at the end of the day, we're, you know, we're, we're getting a bigger hammer to make it work at the, at the final, uh, the final um, uh, part of designing them. Uh, but yeah, the, we could actually replace now that ro robots. We've got robots in that factory that we could replace for thousands of dollars and build within weeks. And they, they pay for themselves in, in weeks. Like you can measure it in weeks, if not months. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and, and then, and, and in terms of the, um, I guess the floor space then as well, we, we spoke yep. a little bit before this in the past offline, but yeah, that'd be yep. just sort of, sort of that whole thought about not not needing anywhere near as much space as what you, you did before. Yeah, I think so. Like if, um, and if you design it correctly and, and the, there's always room for improvement in terms of workflow and things like that. And even just how components uh, enter and exit a machine uh, all of this informs how a layout will will look. We also designed, and again, it's, it comes back to this focus on energy everywhere. So we, we actually designed our robots to fit inside our Iron Matrix modules and be powered off a 10 amp plug, which will allow us to actually power the robots from the solar panels that are actually on the structures for us. So we, we have the, the business model where when we come to scale, and that's really where we're going to focus in 2021, uh, we can basically replicate iron matrix modules that have the robots inside that actually make the steel parts that end up making the modules. Mm. <laughs> Yes, it's Incredible. all uh, turns into a circular reference, doesn't it? He's sucking your, your, your robot this. inception. Um, That's right. <laughs> you get the robots designing some new robots, and then you sorted. You can, and and you Damien, that actually in of itself. So if I as soon as I find a good reason to put it into the budget, three uh, D <laughs> metal printers are actually allowing people to for robots to make themselves. Right. So yeah, the cost of them is just going down exponentially and the growth in their application is also growing exponentially and we add millions of robots to industrial production every year i'm not sure what 2020 is going to look like it, it might be higher who knows mm. uh, a, a, qu a question i've got of you david there is um mm -hmm. obviously the um so obviously robots are doing you know the very repetitive and perhaps even dangerous sort of tasks of removing those from your, your production line piece um, fr from a human resource sort of element, what, what's required, I guess, in this sort of in, in your sort of new age factory? You know, obviously, yep. you don't need the, the the blue collar sort of level, you know, piece potentially, but sort of, you know, how, how's that sort of affected what you're looking at human resource wise? Yeah, look, I always see robots as an extension of of people, really. Um, uh, in my mind, I always imagine what we're doing is that scene with Sigourney Weaver in Aliens 2 where she it jumps into the exoskeleton, right, and does something that no human could do. Um, so with, with, our, with our machines, we, we definitely will always have a minimum of one person uh, running all of that equipment. But what's the, the, the goal is to see how much production that one person can actually create. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of high-level numbers, it, uh, in order to make the economics work, you want a person in Australia to be able to 
produce steel that would otherwise take someone doing manual labor in a low cost center. Uh, so they need to be able to produce like five to 10 times the amount of steel uh, that a person in one of those low cost centers would in order to ensure that you're being internationally competitive. So yeah, we, and look, the, the it, it seems intimidating um, when you look at all of the equipment, uh, but it's actually remarkably sim uh, simple. And, and this is the case for a lot of complex things. It's remarkably simple when you actually understand how all the elements come together. Um, so yeah, I, we actually have in our, in our workshop uh, construction uh, people and uh, there's a guy who, and he can basically rebuild all of the computer elements and componentry uh, to get a, a robot from um, something that's not working to working uh, to the point where he's even programming uh, the motion control of all of the MIG welders and everything like that. So yeah, it's uh, we have fewer people, um, but of course a lot more manufacturing here because we wouldn't have otherwise done it in Australia at all. Hmm. And, and, and I guess that's a, a quite a specialised skill set in Australia. Is that is it sort of something you have you have trouble finding? You know, <laughs> you know it's funny. So the. Um, I, I spoke with in a, at an advanced manufacturing symposium, gosh, 18 months ago now, and people were all suggesting that it was really hard to find people uh, to, to operate and to troubleshoot their robots. Uh, when I started doing this, I learned much of what I, I started with robots, and even our first robot was modelled after a kid in Bangladesh who'd pulled apart a printer and made it into a 3D printer. Hmm. And when I saw him do that, I thought, well, hang on, how hard can this really be? Uh, and then, of course, looking into it, again, it all seems complex when you first look at it, but uh, the individual elements, and if you understand them one by one, uh, slowly you put them together, and the next thing you know, you've actually made something um, not necessarily complex when you do it, uh, but would seem complex from the outside. So, yeah, the actual skills to do this, I believe, can be picked up by anyone. Uh, you, you really only need to understand basic maths to, and, and Cartesian coordinates um, in order to position things and say, I need this to be at this location and, and move at this speed and turn this on and off. Uh, it's all relatively simple logic control uh, systems. And, and really, uh, yeah, it's, it's not that difficult. You, I don't believe that you actually need a specialist skill. I, I will take people uh, that have got a YouTube degree over a, a bachelor's degree because uh, this is where you find out how people do all this stuff, right? That's that's basically where I learned uh, most of what I know about robots. In fact, I would say 99% of it is from YouTube. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And, and and I'm guessing there's a generation of uh, kids growing up on Lego and and remote control cars yeah. and all that type of stuff who are uh, who who have a who have an obsession with this stuff anyway. So sort of going, yeah. really, I, I get to play with robots all day. That's my job. Uh, yeah, yes. Damien, I've got, I got a box right next to me now that is Lego. I think it's called an EV3. And uh, you would not believe how fantastically amazing the automation stuff is in here and what you can program it to do, uh, you know, with a with an iPhone or an iPad, uh, the logic control systems, it recognizes color and sound. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And this is, this is what my nine-year-old is playing with right now. Um, hmm. And yeah, it, it like, what will kids do in the future? One of the um, uh, people we have working for us started his own 3D uh, printing business at the age of 16. Mm. Nice. Yep. yep. Good hire. <laughs> Good hire. Yeah. Excellent hire. Yeah. So, and, and so, you know, I, I guess in terms of how, you know, obviously you guys are sitting here and you're, you're from an advanced perspective, if you're thinking about, um, you know, I guess people who are, who are looking at, other things uh, manufactured in China and, and working out, right? Can I can I set up a um, can I set up a factory in Australia and start doing this? Um, yeah. It sounds as if uh, you know capital wise, you know a few hundred thousand and, and obviously a, a deep interest in this could probably mm -hmm. get you going. Versus you know ten years ago, or twenty years ago, you would have been talking about a few million. Uh, yes, absolutely, and and look, the it is actually the engineering and integration that's the the most difficult part of this. So the the components might have cost a thousand dollars ten years ago, and now they cost a hundred. Uh, and when you're designing something from scratch, it is it takes time, right? It takes takes time to work out how all those things are going to come together to create that repeatability yeah. and and quality. Uh, again, once you've got it, it's there. 
um, it is uh, it, it is more accessible for people to do that, uh, and it does take a little bit of a leap of faith that we can do it. And and Australia, I think, is in a spectacular position because we actually have the educated people to be able to do this sort of thing, and we're not displacing manufacturing jobs in this country. Um, and then, uh, yeah, because we don't for any listers, that's because we don't have any. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and and then, yeah, what we will see is people need to start looking at products that uh, traditionally have required a lot of manual labour, so fiddly little components in them, um, and then ask themselves, can we simplify this or can we change the design? Even if we spend more money on materials, because materials now isn't the major cost component and then ask themselves can we then design something that's manufactured by robots and then do so cheaper than than china or low cost centers where they would otherwise have sent this uh, you know in in previous decades mm. and, and and i guess um in that right as well if you're able to produce it in country then you haven't got that in intellectual property risk issue yep. of, of doing it you know elsewhere um and that, supply chain right yeah so, yeah yep. i mean we we, we kind of look like a genius this year when everyone else was worried about uh supply chain issues um we were doing it for for fundamental reasons but uh yeah that that risk i think is that people are becoming far more conscious of is this yeah. do you think this um this covid year is going to be you know a bit of a banner year for, for this style of thinking do you think you know there's a government of the day and we've got up here government tax cuts so that could be a potential source of of stimulus for um you know for doing things at home and do you think that's that's going to be at the fore going forward given you know this uh, internal reliability sort of problem that we've we've had when supply chains get cut Look, I hope so. I mean, Australia's got a fantastic opportunity to value add to to raw materials and and energy, right? We, at this point in history, we we generally <clears throat> dig our stuff up, send it away, and we we send our energy away, and someone uses that to to create energy wealth, to create this you know prosperity by by adding value to products. Uh, yeah, we should be doing this in Australia. There's there's no two ways about it, and I, I hope Iron Matrix serves as a as a demonstration that we we do have the capability and it's really just a question of willingness um you know that there is a tendency towards apathy in this country but we have a fantastic opportunity uh we have the space we have the resources we have the smarts um we might not have a population of a billion people anytime soon but we could have a billion robots mm -hmm. and that's that's worth thinking about i think Mm. Now, now, in terms of scaling as well, once you, once you're starting to look at these manufacturing processes, and that's that's your next that's 2021, did you say? For yes. your, your plan. yeah, that's so. That's... Yeah, so does that mean you're turning? Are you gonna, you're building a, a, a gigafactory, or or is it more about just distributed um, production? And I'm guessing robots, especially low cost robots, doesn't seem to matter as much whether they, you know, you have a Sydney one, you know, yeah. and a Brisbane one, and a and a Perth one. So, so look, that's one of our strategic advantages, um, I believe, is that uh, we are, as a construction company, we're different from a traditional modular building construction company because they will build a factory, uh, install large equipment and machinery, and then service a area that's within a few hundred kilometres of that factory. Uh, we've designed our production facilities such that we can actually move them anywhere on the planet uh, so and not only that they don't have to be there because all of it because it's modular and you can assemble and disassemble it very easily we can actually move it around um, i don't know how many people are doing this but the the low cost uh, automation equipment and things like solar and batteries are actually the thing that's unlocking this potential so that that just did not exist a few years ago and so I, it's if if it's not happening now, Damien, there's I don't see any reason why it's not going to increase. Uh, you you can actually scale these things without having to make that massive investment. And and we will, when we want to double our production, we'll build another factory. We want to add an, and that's basically how we will scale our business. And each factory. Uh, can cost us less than a hundred thousand dollars. Wow! Because mm. <laughs> that's because that's what I'm thinking through the you know the thought process for me is um, okay. Robots cheap, um, as you said. You put all this work into the design of it, um, and then it seems. And, and, and I guess what I'm saying is is what you're doing seems to me quite replicable through other industries. 
um, yep. or other other manufacturing processes. And it's this whole idea that okay, I've got my in the same way that energy is we're, we're talking about energy moving to sort of localized, which we'll move on to in a second, I guess, localized yep. production. You, you, you sorry, you produce it where you need it, and then you store it in a battery, and you don't have to ship it across hundreds of kilometers. Yep. Is that uh, and three D printing is that same type of thing, and it's going well if if our manufacturing is moving to very distributed as well, then. Um, you're saving a lot on on transports and and that whole process. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So look, the uh, um, traditional manufacturing used to rely on things like um, large injection molding machines and uh, casting um, equipment and things like that. When you do that sort of those that sort of manufacturing techniques, yeah, you're forced to make an investment in large equipment and do so with the intention of having it operating every day for 20 years in order to guarantee a return. Uh, mm -hmm. But these newer manufacturing methods enable that modular, scalable solution. And yeah, I think it, if you can find the product that takes advantage of the, that technology, then yeah, you will get a strategic advantage over everyone and anyone who's doing traditional manufacturing. Mm. Mm. And I wonder though, does it, well, anyway, it's a philosophical thought, but I wonder mm -hmm. how much that means that it actually opens up um, competition a little bit more to, uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you have to build a, a $100 million factory in, in building products, you know, just to produce all your, all your things, then, then that basically means, okay, well, I'm, I'm cut down to a few big competitors who can, who can afford and want to do that. Whereas if it's a matter of going, if you've got a good idea in $100,000, yeah. then you're a competitor. Yep. Um, uh, all of a sudden, you've got a lot more competitors, and <laughs> absolutely, no, it's it's going to. And, and I love a bit of philosophy, so um, yeah, the, this I think that this is exactly what uh, we need to. We, this is what we can predict, and uh, uh, we will see these trends uh, come to the fore. I'm quite sure. Mm -hmm. And a negative for big companies, and a, and a positive for for individuals, I suppose. Yeah, are, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Mm, very good. Um, we'll jump across into the energy side of our chat today, gents. Yeah, yeah I think there's some... Anyway, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that later because there's probably some stock implications that, that I probably haven't fully thought through on that front. But it really <laughs> we can, occur to me, but we can always yeah. chat, Damon. You know, I'm always yeah. happy to chat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's the problem with some of these as well. There's a few things I know. I, 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 David and I speak a little bit independently, and so I know we've had him on the podcast to talk a bit. And I'm, I'm never sure which ones have, we've spoken about on the podcast, and which ones haven't. <laughs> let's, let's let's jump into the um, let's jump into the uh, the energy stuff. I'll give a quick overview of my my um, my thoughts behind it, which and then let's uh, then we'll get on to David's um, yeah his thoughts and and what the implications are. So I just want to run through these um, for anyone who hasn't seen them. We've got a few. A, a chart series out there we, we update every six months or so just sort of showing um solar costs and how um you know over the last 50 60 years uh solar costs have gone from basically being an afterthought um to being the most important thing um in terms of energy costs and so uh the idea is that solar and battery technology are both on what we call a technology curve every year they get cheaper and cheaper and uh, commodities like coal or, or oil and gas are on a scarcity curve. There's the, the more the, the more we dig up, the harder it is to find, and so the more expensive it is. And so I've just got some charts up, just showing how how far solar costs have come down. Uh, the left-hand ones, um, the long-term. The right-hand ones then zoomed in, and and we're looking upon this utility solar plus a battery um, with full shifting. We're calling it as being this this uh, killer application. Once you can, um, if your energy costs are higher than the cost of uh, running a, a solar plus a plus a battery, then um, our, our contention is um, you haven't got a business model anymore, mm -hmm. and that's that's coming down. Nuclear is sort of past that point, um, closing in on coal and and gas, but but they depend very much upon the fuel cost. And so if you flick to the next one, Tim, um, and then so the next one is sort of showing that. Uh, the uh, that battery storage costs are on that exactly that same cost curve uh, coming down dramatically, uh, and a lot of these, um, a lot of the gains we're seeing in both solar and um, batteries. That there's definitely some technological gains, but a lot of it is actually just scale gains in terms of when you've got to produce a thousand widgets, it costs you whatever dollars, but when you can produce a million of them, all of a sudden you, your costs come down by a a, a, a factor. And, and what's happening is um, because the costs are getting now very close to, to parity with these other technologies is 
we're producing a lot more of these, which is then driving the cost down further and, and really has reached this tipping point. Mm. Um, I've got two tables, uh, or three actually, I want to show quickly and then I'll, then I'll, I'll hand back to David. Um, the first one is just showing where uh, levelized costs are um, for different technologies. So basically, utility solar and wind is, is the cheapest option um, in, in reasonably sunny or, or windy conditions at the moment. Um, some of the, uh, the more obscure places, some of the more um, the less well lit places, sort of Moscow or, or London, um, these numbers don't uh, are a little bit further behind. Um, but yeah, clearly, clearly in front. And then even if you start adding batteries now, um, you know, you, you're, you're cheaper than um, high cost coal or high cost natural gas. And then if we jump into how does that look if, if solar and battery prices kept falling for 20%, which is roughly the level they've been falling at for, for the next five years, is you actually get to the stage where it's cheaper to produce a new um, solar, fact, solar farm plus add some batteries in than, than just the fuel cost for a lot of these other mm -hmm. ones. So that's the basic point where you'd say, um, you know, j rather than stick more coal into this coal-fired power plant, it's better for me to shut that whole thing down mm -hmm. and start up a, a, a solar uh, factory right next to it and mm. with solar farm. Then the final one is, um, uh, and this is all available on our website if you, if you want to go into any more detail. Um, final one is just then that rooftop solar is, is very different um, and, and the costs are a lot higher, but the, but the issue is you're not competing with the same factor because for rooftop solar, you don't need the, the, the power lines and the transformers and all, all the infrastructure that goes between them. So uh, on that basis, um, solar plus rooftop solar plus batteries, although the costs are much higher, um, you're actually just comparing to something different. And so they're closing in on exactly those same, um, those same goals. So I might leave it. Leave that's my part. And I'll, I'll back to you, David. Whether you've got any thoughts on this before yeah. we jump into the the implications of what that all means. And look, I, Damon, if you remember rightly, it was when you first published this that uh, I contacted you and said, uh, "I think this is fantastic that you've made these insights." So, and uh, yeah, look, this is exactly the uh, insights that uh, we had as well. Um, going backwards from your last slide, there, I think that one is really critically important. The rooftop plus battery, because what you're actually seeing on the previous slide where you're looking at comparisons and what would a utility company do? Uh, would they do coal or would they do solar and batteries? And and yeah, they, they would move to solar and batteries rather than build a new coal plant. Um, but of course, if you still are getting that distributed to you through the grid, uh, there's someone there who's going to actually make the same amount of money, if not more, uh, off that electricity. But the rooftop solar and battery is the disruptor because you cut out those transmission lines and the cost of metering and the organization and that sits behind and it. the profit um, and yes exactly and um and the the really interesting thing with solar and batteries and and i and i think in another 10 years when we look back on the 2020s this will become more apparent but the feature that solar and batteries have is actually something that they don't have and that is moving parts mm. so what that means is that you can deploy solar and batteries at small scale without losing efficiency and there's no other energy production methods production and storage method uh, that actually achieves that goal even wind and wave nuclear uh, gas and coal all of these things get more efficient the bigger you are. Uh, so what that leads to is centralized power generation and a distributed grid. Uh, it all makes complete sense when, when we built a, a system based on fossil fuels that benefit from those thermal economies of scale. What we're moving to though with solar and batteries is that you can break up these elements and they, they don't lose efficiency and more importantly, if you actually place them close to the location where you're consuming that energy, they're actually even more efficient. Hmm. So you then don't have the losses across that line and you don't have the need to maintain the infrastructure for the distribution as well. So it's the no moving parts that allow solar and batteries to be deployed anywhere uh, that really make it the killer of the, the killer app as far as I'm concerned. And the other thing I have noted on there, I've put an eight percent discount rate, just because that's that's what a lot of these 
comparisons use. Um, <laughs> yeah, for, for most people, what they care about is what's my home loan rate. Yeah. If I can do this for, you know, if I, if I can add another $10,000 to my home loan yeah. and in three years time and put the savings back onto my home loan in three years time in front, then that's all yeah. they care about. Yeah. So if I gave that a 3% discount rate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then but, all of a sudden it, yeah, that sort so of blows a lot of stuff away as well. Damien, a good example with Iron Matrix, we'll build a roof for about $200 a square meter. Uh, that roof at 30 cents a kilowatt hour will generate over $1,000 within 10 years. Mm, yeah. So that's not a bad return on your investment, right? Better than putting that money in the bank. Yeah, or, or tiles. <laughs> or roof or tiles. tiles, yeah, which give you nothing. <laughs> um, a, a question for mine, actually, and you were just talking about the efficiencies of scale, which is, as, as you've said, um, you know, made a lot of sense in the early days. Um, I guess to flip that around and go the other way, right? So if is 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 the actual um, magic point where every single house is basically just you know, and I'm just seeing I'm sitting in suburbia here in Western Melbourne. If they all had their own rooftop solar and battery sort of set up individually, so they're effectively all off grid, is that is that sort of the pinnacle, or is there sort of is there an opportunity where there's perhaps a suburban battery or something? So you're still getting some degree of benefits of scale, David, but you're obviously yeah. you know, keep keeping it on the on the um, yeah. It's a really one. good question, a really good point. The, the the key inflection is actually based on the cost of a delivered unit of energy. So whatever achieves that goal, um, and it's it's a binary thing, right? Like you're not going to um, go to an electricity company and pay 30 cents a kilowatt hour if you can get electricity from someone else from 28. It's a it's a fungible product. You can, uh, as soon as you can get a cheaper option, you go to the cheaper option. So we've stuck with the incumbent to this point in history because it has been legitimately the cheapest way to generate, store and deliver a unit of energy. Um, so that's now changing. So, so now you can achieve that uh, with uh, solar on your roof and your own batteries. Um, I don't believe that a community battery actually does you any favours. What... Mm you might benefit from, uh, and, and only because then you're taking up extra space somewhere, so that costs money, and then you're actually putting in the distribution lines, and then you have to manage who's putting things in and who's pulling things out. Uh, I actually think that we will we'll move to our houses kind of the, the same way as, as we moved our electronic devices. They, they all come closer to us so that we can control exactly what they do for us. Uh, so my sense is that people, one at a time, will actually move to their own solar rooftop system with a battery. And then if they choose to, they might end up starting to trade with their neighbours if they actually see that there is value to be create, created there. And I'm not sure that there's going to be. I don't think it will actually pay for itself in order for you to invest in that infrastructure. Because what's actually going to happen is you're going to have an excess of solar and what you're going to do is find places to soak that up. So you're going to end up uh, buying an electric car and you're going to charge it with every single extra kilowatt hour that you produce from the battery in your own home. Uh, why would you sell it to someone else if you, you can actually get more value out of it yourself? It all comes down to where does the cheapest uh, dollars per kilowatt hour come from. Mm. Or, or whether there's a, you know, if the lines are already there, they're sort of, they're, they're kept, but it's almost like it's going to reverse in that basically going, well, yeah. well, David, if you're pumping out some extra stuff and, yep. and I want to, I want to run a, uh, an aluminium smelter that needs lots of, lots of energy, then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll offer a fee to everyone to, I'll have you yeah. spare all your spare energy during the day rather than having to build yeah. my own solar farm or. There, yeah. there will be some arbitrage there for a, for a period of time, but I, yeah, yeah I, and uh, that's kind of the transition in my mind. Um, and uh, yeah, I do actually agree with you, Damien. It will, if you're going to be using the grid, uh, you'll use it for backup to start, mm. and then it will transition to a point where you're actually putting more out than in. But, but you spoke a little bit about range anxiety on the thing. Yeah. I sort of, I wonder hmm. as well. If this is the point where, you know, I, I feel as if 20 years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was. Um, there was triple O anxiety, and, and that was what the the phone companies. You got to keep your landline. Got to keep your landline. You know, cause yeah. what if your phone runs out of batteries? You need to call triple yeah, zero. Yeah. Yes. And then eventually people went, you know what? My phone's pretty much all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Absolutely. need to pay whatever it was, fifty bucks a month anymore to, to have that on. 
And I, I suspect the range anxiety, they're just working on that same thing. You know, what happens yep. if, you know, you can't drive 600 kilometers in a day, David, when you only ever drive 20? Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, it's going to, it's going to, uh, your, your concern over that is just going to naturally dissipate to the point where, yeah, we laugh about the things that uh, we used to worry about. It'll be a Y2K yeah. problem. Yeah. Or it'll be something where you go, it's a bit like, you know, you go, yes, yes, I can get a battery delivered. Yeah, it'll cost me, you know, a couple hundred bucks to have one delivered, but somebody will come and plug a battery into my house if I happen to run out because... Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's actually... Um, yeah, it is. look, that's an exist. interesting business model. If my wife gave me permission, I would talk more about. Um, but yeah, <laughs> batteries on wheels, right? So automated cars, they're, they're, that's basically what they are. Yeah. Uh, what's stopping a battery actually driving around and going to location? If you need it, you call it up on the app. It doesn't have a driver. It sits there. It probably doesn't look like a car. It's just a box on wheels. Um, and yeah, it can drive around and and at almost marginal zero cost. It's being generated from solar. The, the capital has been invested. So yeah, that battery can move around. I think that range anxiety and running out of electricity, electrons, uh, yeah, will be an antiquated notion. Hmm. Well, certainly, I think they'll they'll do pretty well in Melbourne. Uh, unlike yourself over in Perth, David, where you, you probably get what four overcast days a, a year. Is it? What, what's the maximum? What, what, what's the current? Re- yeah, what's the current record in Perth but, uh, for the year? But uh, we're, we're we're probably the opposite. No, oh, no, look, I've got solar at home, and I, I'm out the front watching it all the time. You know, what the the daily usage is and all the rest of it. And um, mm-hmm. I must admit, yeah, it, it fluctuates pretty wildly down here. You, you know, you, you might go from a, a four kilowatt day to a yeah. forty kilowatt day in the space of a week. You know, it's incredible. Yeah. 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 And and look, yeah. Tony Sieber has just released a report about this uh, Rethink X is, is future of energy. And he talks about the fact that uh, as this becomes cheaper, the, the best life cycle cost to the optimum life cycle cost point is where you actually have four times the number of panels than you need and yeah. like 30 to 90 uh, hours of battery storage. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then you've basically got what he calls, I think, a, a super abundance of, of solar power available to do a bunch of other stuff and then you've you you will always get your bare minimum Uh, but yeah as damien says like that that anxiety and that concern will just be ameliorated by the technology and it and it's uh basically improving every year Mm. all right very good uh would you like to we'll jump across to cost implications Yeah, so this, yes, it's, I mean, I've sort of titled this as, as, as losers are easier to find than winners, because that's where, you know, we, we spend, throughout what we're, what we're investing in, in our portfolio is, is we tend to look very much and say, okay, I, I know who's going to, I know who's going to lose out of this. Um, it's, it's the existing players. And, but, but finding the winners is often quite difficult because the technology, um, which, which technology is going to work. And then, and that technology might be great for, for three years. And then all of a sudden, something, something else comes along. And so, but there's a few, there's a whole bunch of different topics here. And then David, you probably don't, don't feel limited to these ones, but I thought mm. these are some of the ones we could touch on that, um, I guess yeah. the, uh, the top, yeah. top points are most interesting. And Damien, I'd listen to your, the Nucleus Wealth podcast religiously now, because I've, I've heard people and, and I love the fact that you've got a diversity of opinion, um, on this podcast. When Jeff Booth, I think, came on, was mm. it The Price of Tomorrow, his yep. book, and he was saying how technology is inherently deflationary. Um, it seems obvious after he said it, uh, but yeah, that's exactly the reason why it becomes adopted, is that we are able to do things more efficiently, which drives the price down. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the in- energy industry now, is that, as you say, technology is going to drive the cost of energy down. It's just fascinating. Mm. And, and see, what's interesting on this whole energy deflation as well is that um, as the, for a, a poorer person, the energy... The, so as you go from a developing country to a rich country, yes, your energy needs picks up a fair bit. But a poorer person to a rich person in terms of living, their living energy actually is very, very similar. It's, it's mainly the, the travel energy that changes, isn't it? The, yeah, so and, and I would I would suggest as well, and taking a, a slightly uh, different view of that, developing countries are developing because they don't have access to low cost energy. Hmm. Okay, that is actually the fundamental thing that drives prosperity, and and you look at the difference between countries in Africa versus countries in the Middle East. What is the fundamental difference? Is that some of them have got 
massive reservoirs of potential energy sitting underneath the ground. Mm. Mm. And these yeah. fundamentally drive drive prosperity. And then, yeah, basically people, I believe people will actually use as much energy as you make available to them. Uh, it is not, a, no one's ever turned around and said, I, I, I need a slower car or a smaller house or less handbags, right? Yeah, I was going to say will... my, my wife could attest to that. I think the amount, of light, the amount of light she leaves on in our house, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to say handbags. You and get yourself in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I've said I'm sure I've said all those to my wife the same <laughs> the other way. Sure, yeah. But anyway. we are, and uh, you know, the male version is the uh, is the carbon Fuck fiber car. racing bike that uh, you take out on a Sunday morning to get a latte, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's a bit cool. So we will always we will always find ways to spend available energy, and and our fundamental prosperity is actually driven by our capacity to access low cost energy. And that's, that's exactly why Australia is in the fantastic position it is. We've got a low population, we've got a massive amount of energy. Canada is the same. Yep. Mm. I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting question though, as, as so if, if we doubled, say well, we halved the price of energy, for example, and, double, and in fact, we doubled the availability to people, yep. is going, yeah, it seems as if to me, that's the most obvious place for them to spend it is probably in travel. Yep. Um, like within a, within a house, yeah, look, having an electric car is a, is a big one, but, yep. uh, but in a way that's, that's really a, um, that's sort of a, a loss for the oil and gas energy, energy mm -hmm. system as, as well. So that there's a certain amount of energy that's still sort of being used. I, I don't think, I think if, if I said to you, David, I've just halved the cost of your driving, you wouldn't then say, oh, great. I'm going to drive twice as much now. Uh, it's so funnily enough, Damon, there's a, there's a phenomenon known as Javon's paradox, which actually suggests that that's what happens. You make things more efficient and people actually end up using more of it. Um, and uh, it's, it might not be instantaneous, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, the, the forces that actually drive consumer behavior, uh, and this is, you know, so the premise of the, the, the book I wrote is actually driven by access to lower cost energy. Um, well, I see. In terms of travel, I'm with you, but I guess what I'm saying, mm -hmm. in terms of your own personal, like, would you then say, okay, I'm gonna, I need, I need to drive around town twice as much as what I used to. Yep. I need to drive twice as far. So, because there's a time, there's a time element, I guess, time, to it. Yeah. In, in, in no, what I'm but you might drive twice as fast. Mm. Right. And yeah. acceleration is a function. You take more energy to go faster, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, and it's not a it's not a one to one, and it's not linear, and yeah, and any one individual uh, doesn't isn't the isn't the rule. But statistically, you look over a population, and yeah, you make more low cost energy available, it'll get cheaper. Interestingly, yeah. as well, and at the risk of getting too philosophical here, uh, I actually believe that uh, that prosperity as well is a function of the energy return on investment, right? So if you're producing energy, and for the last century, uh, we've had uh, energy returns on investment like in excess of 20 to one out of oil and gas. So that's a lot of energy left over after you've spent whatever energy you needed to to access it in the first place. Those numbers have just been going down and down and down and down. Uh, and it's nothing suggests- so Just to confirm, I just want to confirm just for, for my own benefit, but also any yeah. listeners. So that's basically saying um, it cost me one unit of energy to get um, a, a barrel of oil out of the ground. And then that gets me 20 units of, of energy when people spend yes. that. Yep. And yes, so that's, how, and that's what it used to be in like the seventies and eighties, right, Damien? But, and, but now, uh, and I can attest to this because this was uh, the thing that uh, made me very uncomfortable staying in the oil and gas industry is just, Reservoirs are getting deeper, more complex, uh, harder to produce, more dangerous. Um, uh, the, the, the components, uh, the compositions are, are harder to deal with. Um, and basically the, the energy that you have to invest in order to access those reservoirs is getting higher and higher. And so now the number today is as low as six to one. Mm. So you only get six units of energy back for the one unit and it's possible that 2020 it's even lower, right? Yes, and then and then the key inflection point, I believe, is when solar and batteries will actually give you a better energy return on investment, uh, and that's that's really that's what we're we're at that point today, which is yeah. what makes this whole thing so fascinating. 
Because mm. yeah, because because they're going obviously in the opposite direction. The, yes, uh... and and this is you know I think when I sent you a note a couple of weeks ago, Damien, this is the the crazy potential for the white swan, right? So if that prosperity, which I think has been waning over the last decade, and we've been doing our best to to mitigate the impacts through um, fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, if our true prosperity, if, if suddenly we had a magic energy machine, if someone in, had, had devised fusion, uh, then we would have a level of prosperity that would accelerate things. Um, and I think it's worthwhile thinking about that because solar and batteries have the potential to do that. Robots, low cost energy, producing more of these components, making them cheaper, as you said, because we're making more of them. And then it's just a it's a snowball upwards. Right. And all of a sudden uh, we've got solar and batteries potentially giving an energy return on investment of 10 to one, maybe even 20 to one one day. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, if you look across, let's say, Australia and you said, OK, the average if you took together the your electricity bill and your your gas bill and your uh and your your petrol bill i don't know you might be five grand a person i suppose i don't know maybe mm -hmm. maybe that's too high maybe that's probably per household five grand a household but yep. um yeah if you can knock 20 percent off that that's a yep. that's a big amount onto people's disposable income and, and if yeah. that's a continuous drive down yes yeah, so i'm completely yeah, with yeah. you on that yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's that point about when you hit the crossover and, and i think i think we're hitting that point mm -hmm. is now to question a little bit about whether um governments are going to basically go well yeah but we want to we want to protect all the uh all these guys who have these big distributed networks yeah, and yeah. Um, make sure they don't lose out so we'll, we'll try yeah. and keep prices high for a few years yeah look there are there are definitely social impacts that need to be considered uh, around this transition no two ways about it and there's a lot of incumbent interests uh but you you can't fight the laws of thermodynamics right if you are doing something where you're genuinely getting a better energy return on investment, uh, mm. then that is going to win out at the end of the day. It doesn't. It doesn't actually matter what people want. Uh, the universe and, and laws of thermodynamics don't care what people want. It is yeah. actually a function of that energy relationship. And and so yeah, I mean we can we could possibly delay things here in Australia, but we have a fantastic opportunity to get ahead of the curve. And I actually think what will happen is when people start making money out of this, then they can do what traditionally um, oil companies will do, which is lo lobby governments for, <laughs> for things like carbon taxes. And that will just, again, accelerate the, the transition, right? Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, then they'll, they'll build the public sentiment against the incumbent, uh, which will just support the new energy as well. Uh, but yeah, the, the right people need to be uh, really starting to benefit for that to happen, but it will happen. Yeah, but one of the benefits as well is because we we do well, a benefit vaguely, but but because our our, our energy costs are so much higher than the US, yep. um, is that we obviously get the benefit earlier because as as this technology cost comes down and Australia is quite a sunny place, yeah. um, we start getting start getting the, the benefits of that transformation is that you know thirty cents a kilowatt turns into twenty eight turns into twenty five doesn't yep. make a difference to the US because they're already much lower, but for us it's it's beneficial all the way down and yeah. Yeah, as we yeah no, Australia is a fantastic petri dish to to be basically doing these sort of things and applying these technologies. And uh yeah, it's it's interesting when you say the thirty cents per kilowatt hour, even our fuel costs, right? If you actually work out uh, how much uh, energy goes to the wheel based on a litre of petrol these days, that also gives you a 30 cent per kilowatt hour number mm. as well. All right. Oh, right. Okay. Just, yeah, because I've done a um, sort of bit of stuff on that and I know mm -hmm. there's that, uh, you know, this is a little bit what we're talking about before about saying um, uh, you're just distributing, um, we well, said distributing solar panels and, and batteries or batteries in particular, let's say, um, doesn't make a difference you have the scale benefit it doesn't so you don't you don't lose out on the scale benefit having yep. a massive batteries you know no different to having the smaller batteries and whereas for the for the you're saying for the for the uh, motors it's the opposite and what we've done for cars is we've effectively got you know a, a five million small battery if it was five million small motors running around everywhere whereas mm. if you replace them with um with batteries you actually get that scale benefit. I suppose we're losing scale benefit by having a distributed motor. Whereas, yeah. yeah. 
small yeah. engines are not very efficient right mm. so your if if your diesel is better than 35 percent efficient you're doing really well mm. uh, whereas an electric motor will take the energy inside a battery and put it to the wheels at a 90 percent efficiency uh, and that's why yeah um, in terms of kilowatt hours available com from petrol compared to electricity as your analysis showed damien it's like a factor of three right you're better off uh, putting those putting that energy uh, and retaining it as an electron and putting it into an electric motor uh, then then combusting it and getting 30 percent of that energy as mechanical motion mm. Mm. yeah that's right so so um exported energy as well so that's that's yeah. one so, so we've got um i think mike cannon brooks and a few guys they're, they're setting up these solar farms and then running effectively big long cables over talking about running big long cables over to uh, malaysia or was it singapore yep. uh, no, singapore yeah 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 so yeah, the high voltage uh, DC cable. Yeah, so it seems to me that's got like a that's got a short window where it might be successful before batteries just swamps it. You just it's going to be it. really interesting. Um, the the thing that would concern me about that project, like I think it actually would be shown to the its potential. You could deliver a kilowatt hour at the door in Singapore. You know, three five cents per kilowatt hour. The problem is you're then subject to a PSA, um, a power supply agreement with whoever's at the other end. Uh, and that's that's then the chance for someone to eat your lunch. Um, unless you've locked in a, a PSA, uh, and that's what it all come down to, I think, the economics of that project. I think they're doing the you know pre-feasibility analysis right now. The economics of that project will be dictated by the terms with which they can negotiate. Now, if I was Singapore, would I negotiate something for 15, 20 years that, that justifies the investment in that DC cable? Um, I don't know the answer to that. It, it, that's a political question for the, for the people of, of Singapore and, and how quickly do they want to try and decarbonise their electricity supply? Because mm. it, it's, it's um, the other thing, I guess, is I'm guessing it's a lot closer to Sydney than what it is to Singapore from there or... or... Or a similar uh, distance. I don't right? think so. No, I think Singapore's like five hour flight from Perth, uh, and so okay. it's quicker from the Kimberley, Pilbara. Uh, hmm. Okay, because I was thinking that because you've sort of got the same benefit in terms of well, you can supply Sydney. What when it's when it's night time in Sydney? Yeah. Still <laughs> you can... Damien, you you are super clever. So yeah, I I thought I looked at that project, and my initial thought was if you're going to put in one of those cables, you should be going east west, not north hmm. south. Yeah. Because then you can chase the sun. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And and you know I could I could foresee a world where we had one cable going around the equator, and you're effectively chasing the sun at any one point and pumping it to the to the dark side of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I do. Because I, 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 I was wondering whether uh, I'm, I'm, you know it's obviously not your specialty. I was sort of uh, I guess I was abstractly wondering. You know I wonder if it's cheaper to have a cable in the ocean because you don't have to pay anyone for it. You don't have to yeah. dig up ground to make sure nobody runs over it whatever then what are yeah. these running across the country i don't know it's just, uh, uh yeah weird. i don't know I, look we laid we used to lay pipelines in the oil and gas industry it's not easy mm. um you've got to you've got to trench them you've got to you've got to put stuff on to stop people dragging anchors across them uh you've got to make sure that currents don't sweep them away uh, i right. think a dc cable has probably got a lot better strength and and less concern if you get a rupture than an oil and gas pipeline um and so yeah i don't know the answer to that yeah you could leave a bit of you can leave bits so that things can brush against and it's not gonna you have to worry about it you know well, i guess what i'm saying is that the a pipeline you have to worry about something something that runs into it might crack it whereas yep. the, the the line you can just put flex in it so it'll just sway so. a few, a few yeah. meters i think yeah. so i don't know i haven't done any engineering on on large so, dc copper cables okay um, let's, yeah, let's get something <laughs> We've got a few things on um, on some of the land cost versus solar potential. So dollars per per square meter per year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, gosh, I do this for the purposes of explaining to uh, people who are interested in iron matrix. So uh, yeah, we will a structure an iron matrix structure can generate up to a kilowatt hour of electricity a day. Um, and uh, you know, over I can't remember what the number is now. Um, basically. Uh, you know that'll that'll give you like 25 cents a day um and then yeah that that over 10 12 years you can get up to a thousand dollars out of that so those are so kind so of the high level numbers 
one panel in your in No, your that's house. like one. So that's like we do it. The one panel is actually two square meters for us. So I try to do yeah. things on a dollars per square meter basis because oh, okay. a lot of people oh, then factor yeah. in. So, you know, our our structure costs about a thousand dollars a square meter for the steel and the solar panels. Um, yep. and, and yeah, basically we've got a structure that pays for itself. If you fit that out as a house, you know, you'll pay 1800 to $2,000 a square meter uh, for a building. But the, yeah, the really interesting thing about that, of course, is that if you're not maximizing the amount of solar from a, a footprint, and as we were saying earlier, the transition happens and it's binary. So all of a sudden you can achieve this energy cheaper and it's just a 100% flip, right? And there's no reason to go back to, to oil and gas and coal, uh, then yeah, your land is now worth a thousand dollars a square meter over over ten years. Yes, just because of the amount of sunlight that's hitting it. So just yeah. purely on the sunlight, and I think that that will inform real estate prices, right? So uh, for anyone who who will listen, I I suggest you know if you're buying uh, real estate, you'll want to consider whether it's north facing and whether it's shaded. Mm. that will be a, a value proposition i i there there will be people that make software that allow you to calculate how much irradiance a particular plot of land uh will see in a over a 10-year period mm. yeah. so it's okay so sorry so the, so the rough numbers was sorry a thousand dollars per thousand dollars over 10 years was it yes yes over 10 years okay, and, so. and you can get about a, a kilowatt hour per square meter now that's uh, we actually clad walls and ceiling so that's to get that number it's like about 0. 0.6 if you just account for the roof only so the roof right and so and then if i've got a two-story house versus a one-story house what's the uh what's the yeah so that you know you're, you're not actually changing those economics greatly because it all comes no. down to footprint right so yeah that's a really interesting question and point um, so for me, I would rather purely because I love the energy side of it, I'd rather have people with big flat structures in remote locations uh, than tall, skinny ones in um, in urban, uh, suburban locations, right? Yeah. Uh, the value proposition is actually better. And uh, yeah, you know, people are looking for a tree change now. If they can go off grid and have their autonomous car drive them home again, it's, uh, it's kind That's of a win-win-win. Right. And Zoom meetings. Well, don't, and you, Zoom know, meetings. Won't need, you won't need your autonomous car. Yeah, we won't be... need to integrate with anyone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but uh, okay, so um, so per person, then to, to give to give to give mm. a, an average person enough energy just on a so if, excluding the transport side of it. So let's say we, we move yep. the transport away and we just say just just your your average heating, cooling, yeah, running, yeah. You, you have six different laptops and phones and all that type of stuff. Yep. Um, how much space how many how many uh, how many square meters per person do you need do you think yeah so i did some numbers and used a, a say a 10 by 6 structure so an average two by three house right and you say that's yep. like 160 square meters um so yeah you can generate on that about uh, anywhere from 100 to up to 150 kilowatt hours a day and to show as a comparison the average house would use about 25 kilowatts hours a day of electricity. Right. So you've got the potential then to have four to five times the amount of energy that you actually use if you convert all of your roof. Uh, and that, that means every square centimeter. And I'd, I'd like to believe that Iron Matrix is the only technology that allows you to do that. Um, that you can basically generate four to five times the amount of energy. So you'll use all that you want in your house store it in batteries uh but more likely you will store it in your vehicle and that mm. was with a 160 square yeah, meter about one square 60 square meters right okay yeah, yeah. it's that... like th those numbers are a real eye opener right yeah yeah absolutely because it sort of comes back to that point about um you know inner city living and apartments and all that type of stuff and well they're, they're still going to need to get um energy from somewhere but if, yep. if you're starting to build buildings that are that are um largely solar panels as well then then maybe they don't need much energy from elsewhere i suppose is where i'm yeah and look let's ask ourselves why it is that people live in apartments right it, it was traditionally cheaper because you had availability of centralized power generation um mm. you don't have to catch the the, the training or, or you can catch public transport to get to where you need to go 
uh, the world in another 10 years might look like remote living with autonomous vehicles shuttling people around if if and when they need to. Mm. Yep. Um, okay, just conscious of time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we could chat all day. Yeah, that's right. Let's do hydrogen and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on uh, on hydrogen as a... So it's really interesting. I mean, this is this is quite contentious, even amongst um, engineers. You know, uh, Elon Musk uh, calls the a, a fuel cell the full cell. <laughs> um, the, there's a lot of people interested in hydrogen right now. And uh, starting with the, the things that are great about hydrogen uh, is its energy density. So, you know, you can, with a kilogram of, of hydrogen, you can send a car 100 kilometres. And, and if you compare that to petrol, a kilogram of petrol will send you like 15 kilometres. So energy density hydrogen is just fantastic. So in any application where you're weight sensitive, uh, you want to be using hydrogen. And, and if you're going into space, uh, hydrogen is your best option, hands down. Uh, the issue is that hydrogen is just a very difficult mm. uh, molecule to, to have to manage. It's the smallest molecule in the universe, um, and you can't put it in anything because it basically will slip through the <laughs> lattice of atoms um, and so you have to be able to store it in specialized equipment uh, you need to compress it uh, in order to get that energy density um, and then you need to run it either you're either combusting it and losing efficiency or running it through a, a, a fuel cell and, and losing like uh, efficiency as well now if, and based on the premise that uh, that we've uh, held and has been the basis of iron matrix uh, we will always move to the source where you get the best energy return on investment, this energy wealth that we talk about. And hydrogen, the efficiency over the life cycle of hydrogen just cannot compete. Hmm. You get about, uh, for, the, for the energy that you put in, you will only get about 20% of it back out. Uh, when you compare that to batteries, you put the same electron into a battery, you get like 90% of it back out. So yeah, on an energy return on investment basis, uh, hydrogen is just going to always struggle. Um, uh, someone I, I respect his, uh, his p opinion was that he, he had nothing personal against um, hydrogen, but the, th the laws of thermodynamics have something against hydrogen and no one's won an argument with those for a very, very long time. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And I sort of, I, I think I said to you, I sort of feel as if it's a, um, it, to me, it's like a battery. Like it's sort of basically going because because whereas whereas um, oil, I pull it out of the ground and then I transform it and stick it in my car, and I, so I'm not really doing that much. But the energy is already there. Whereas yeah. hydrogen, I don't pull out of the ground. I actually have to create it, yeah. and so it's a matter of pouring the energy into it first to get it to that point. Yeah, absolutely. And, so yeah, the hydrocarbons are have got inherent storage, uh, yeah. whereas hydrogen is purely storage. You have to put energy into it in order to actually have it as an energy source or to create the hydrogen. Uh, then you can transport it at expense and then and then use it. Look, I think a lot of hydrogen at this stage is getting, um, is getting pushed by uh, incumbent interests. So the, the cheapest way to manufacture hydrogen is actually steam re reforming methane. Uh, that's how like 95% of industrial hydrogen is produced today. Uh, and that would be considered black hydrogen because if you're not sequestering the carbon, uh, there's another option where, which uh, is referred to as blue hydrogen, where you um, make hydrogen from methane, natural gas, uh, but you effectively sequester the carbon, and that's that's effectively a carb a self-imposed carbon tax. Mm. Uh, and then you have green hydrogen, which is where you take a unit of energy produced by something like wind or solar, and then yeah, as you said, Damien, you, you store it within hydrogen. Uh, to, to use in a different location, but then you have the the, the efficiency challenges with that. Mm. Yeah, I hadn't realised the efficiency was so bad on those, because that sort of means even if you got, I mean, uh, they've been trying these things for a while, but even if you've tripled the the, uh, yeah. the efficiency of it, you're still a long still way behind. away from the efficiency of a, yeah. a battery. 
Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to compress hydrogen, right? Because it's such a small molecule. You can't. You. You. you in order to pressurize something, you generally accelerate it. Uh, and yeah, because there's very little mass to it, it's actually really difficult. You then it heats up as you compress it, and that heat is lost. So mm -hmm. those yeah. those elements you will never get over. If you have to compress hydrogen, you're always going to lose energy in the process. And uh, yeah, those things uh, don't really come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wonder as well, I mean, I, I, this is only speculation. I, I don't know that much about it. So, but it's, mm. it, I feel as if, um, say, carbon capture and sequester, CCS as it's known, yeah, yeah. Is, basically, is, is basically the pipe dream for people who have, have spent, you know, 50 years in the uh, in the coal industry and mm. and figure this this will keep my, this could, might keep it going for a little bit longer. Yep. Um, I feel as if hydrogen might be a little bit the same for people who have been doing internal combustion engines and you sort of like going, well, yeah. I've, I've been doing those, we're pouring petrol into it but uh if that goes away then i need something else so that i can still justify being an expert yeah, in custom, yeah. Custom. well and you know funnily enough you can't actually put hydrogen into a normal engine because the molecules are so small they slip between the grains of the metal and call uh right. into what's known as hydrogen embrittlement yeah. uh it cracks the hydrogen and your metal basically uh, erodes um right. so yeah it's it's even and it's not that easy even if you were to combust it yeah, uh, but you still, do, still a challenge. You need the same type of engine, though, isn't it? It's still combustion. You need a, you, uh, yes, it's still combustion. And really what you would do is actually fire it in a boiler. That's the simplest way. You put it between pistons and piston rings, and, uh, yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All, All right. right. Okay. Well, is there anything else, David, on the on the energy side? Or do we... Oh gosh, yeah, I could talk about this for uh, hours on end, but uh, yeah, I think we've hit the the major points. Uh, look, the 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 transition is coming. Um, uh, I, uh, there's there's going to there's going to be some changes and and people. Uh, it's going to be just uncomfortable, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I do think that over this next decade, we're gonna we're going to see the potential for this uh, prosperity driven by this increased energy wealth that will come from improved return on investment. And, and yeah, I think that could potentially change how we view things going forward. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe a, an, another episode, but uh, the fiscal and monetary policies to support that new world is going to be super interesting. And and Damien, I suspect you're going to do a lot more thinking about this uh, than anyone in Australia going forward. Yeah, no, I definitely will. And yeah, I'm sure we'll be. I'm sure we'll be talking in the future about that part. Mm -hmm. um, it just, I might, I might drop in just for uh, for anyone uh, listening in live as well. We're just going to roll into the investment implications in a minute, and uh, just to drop in any final questions as well, and we'll, we'll get through those afterwards. Um, just one quick question on that one, David. And you mentioned fiscal and monetary and uh, policies and, and government intervention. It's sort of been a thought of mine for a long time, and I often wonder. We we're talking before about um, solar arrays, sort of you know piped up to um, to Singapore. You know, you know, is is it from a from a I guess from an overall um, from a government perspective? You know, do you think they'll we'll ever find a government that's sort of got the will or the volition to you know create like a an industrial or a manufacturing zone where they could, you know, build an array and figure me on the numbers here, but hundred megawatt, whatever it is sort of sitting out in the, you know, with batteries or whatever, and they could create this, this area where startups, perhaps even such as yourself could go in there with, with bright ideas, local, local um, knowledge and manufacturing and pay two cents a kilowatt or something and just, you know, and, and obviously use that as that, as a bit of a, um, as you said, a Petri dish or, a, you know, a breeding yeah. ground for, for an innovation. This technology will unlock land in locations that we wouldn't have considered going to before so you know where most of the cities in the world are on rivers right for a good reason it was more efficient to transport goods that way um, so solar and batteries unlock uh, land and the potential to live and and work and be prosperous uh, in almost any location on the planet um, so yeah absolutely governments could could do that i i definitely advocate uh, for governments to do things that improve the opportunities, don't don't try and and manage the outcomes. If you manage the outcomes, uh, you end up making things less efficient. But uh, yeah, we want to we want to encourage people to realise the opportunities that we've got in front of us. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we'll jump across to in investment implications, uh, and I've, I've kicked it off with the uh, U.S. election implications. It looks like Biden is pretty close to home. Damien, uh, is this where are we at on the Green New Deal? Is this is this something to think about? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I uh, look. 
is, I mean, the Green New Deal in the end is is really, a, I guess, a set of principles as opposed to a, a direct, this is exactly what they're going to do. And so I think he's, I think there's certainly support from from um, the Democratic side for, for a lot of that, which, which is investing in a lot of these technologies and saying that, yes, or, or even if just research and development in, in these parts. So um, the uh, it does look, though, um, as if the Senate is probably going to be divided still. There's a few, there's a few ones right down the, that that might end up sort of sw- switching it one way or the other, and and potentially if you if you end up with a Biden pre- presidency, which looks likely as well, is um, there's there's a few senators who um, on the, from the Republican side who are probably bullied into um, supporting stuff they they may not may or may not have wanted to, um, uh, which which might actually be happy they might be happy across the floor under a under a Democratic um, president. So, uh, you know, there's still some hopes there, but I think the hopes of a, a massive um, uh, stimulus plan and, and you know, getting everything they wanted, I think, is, is out the door. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, but I think you will see some, some, some positives on, on that front. Uh, the other investment implications, I mean, these ones are more just about, this is more stock specific implications that we're looking at, but it's probably worth highlighting. I probably should have started with the, the, the fact of that, um, the, what we spoke about before that we do, that I do think there's a, a a significant cost saving coming for consumers right around the world um, and places like Australia places with high energy costs like Australia or, or Europe will benefit first and, and we're, we're roughly about the time where we should be benefiting now and I think that in in, in Australia and um, and Europe I think um, energy costs if not at the peak they're very very close to the peak and over the next 20 years um, yeah the, 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 the trend is going to be considerably down. You probably won't notice the effect in, say, the US um, for another five years or so because they do have so much cheap energy there. But but then you'll start getting that same effect there as well. Um, if you've got any, uh, so so in terms of stocks, anything in coal, you know, we're treating basically as just as done. Uh, coke and coal, we still think you know for steel manufacturing, um, is there still um, uses there? That's not that's not going away. But um, in terms of your thermal coals, um, you know, we're the, this is not somewhere we're we're interested in at all. You'd have to be getting it at, at almost free to to, to make it worthwhile. Um, anyone with large undeveloped fossil fuel reserves, um, you just want to put a very low a low value on. Um, if it's an oil or gas um, reserves, then your problem there is that uh, the U.S. can switch on and off their um, uh, their shale gas so quickly that that you really don't want to be out spending billions of dollars developing some some massive um, oil field that's going to last for, for, for 30 years when um, you just don't know what your demand is going to be going that far in front. There's there's probably are going to be some short-term dem- demand supply imbalances. So you will find because um, you know, there is this bias for to not do major projects at the moment, um, you might find that you get you do get an oil price spike or, or you get a, a coal price spike from time to time. But um, you know, I'd be very much treating those as a chance to sell if you, if you own this you own it and not as like a a sign that the cycle is about a new cycle is about to begin and, and prices are going to go um sky high nuclear i'm unconvinced on um i won't i could spend a whole bit on that but but yeah it's for some of those charts i guess showing the main thing is that the costs just don't seem to stack up um in terms of the uh yeah, so, so we do think it's very, quite positive for longer term economic growth. Um, if, you, if you're looking at companies that have got energy intensive processes, then subject to, to them actually having pricing power, then we think there's um, you know, certainly scope for, for prices to come down in that. So maybe things like aluminium um, is, is one example. Having said that, um, yeah, do you have the pricing power on those? So, uh, but, but that's, that's one factor. Uh, we look a lot at some of the semiconductor stocks where we where we see some some benefits, but the, the issue with these ones is these aren't the parts of the semiconductor stocks that are, that are producing the parts. You know, as, as David spoke about before, you know, the hundred dollar parts or or quite cheap ones that they don't have a lot of um, uh, margin, not heaps of, uh, <laughs> or, or intellectual property in mm. it. So um, it's it's the commodity end of those. Um, that's that you can see some benefits, but you know you, you got to be really careful about the price you pay for those. Um, the robot side's quite tough. Um, the, we sort of spent a while looking at a lot of the robotic guys. The, the big issue with a lot of the robotic guys is that um, most of them uh, that produce them also make a lot of money from oil and gas, hmm. um, and so you, you're a little bit stuck there in terms of saying, well, I've got 
I've got one part of the business I really like and another part of the business that I don't like. And so, um, you know, there's, there's some some ones in there we've we've got exposure to or, or looking to get exposure to, but um, but yeah, it's one of those areas that you know it's it's hard to find um, stocks that actually sort of fit the the whole uh, factor. And it, and it's more the service side we find quite interesting in terms of stocks that um, have exposure to. Uh, to changes, whether it's, um, you know, so, so we are expecting quite a lot of changes within the utility prices um, over the next few years and um, and stocks that are doing the servicing in that um, we think will, will, will benefit. But as David's spoken of, you know, it's one of those things that from this, I'm, I'm going to be certain taking out and thinking a little bit more about is, is um, you know, I hadn't, I I'd, I'd definitely thought about the idea that, that uh, energy will be a lot more distributed. It'll be a lot less centralized, but um, I don't think it really tweaked me the ideas with the manufacturing that that you also get manufacturing a lot more decentralized, which is a, a negative for big companies. Um, you know, it's one of the, 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 the real benefits of big companies is is the um, uh, the benefits of scale. And, and if you're starting to lose a lot of that, then um, yeah, I'll have to have a bit more of a think about who that will affect and, and where that goes from there. Mm, okay, very good. Uh, any, anything to add on that one, David? No, I think, um, yeah, no, it's all, all very interesting insights. Things are, are going to be volatile. Yeah, fundamentally, you want to see who benefits from lower cost energy uh, and who benefits from applying the technology in a way that uh, allows you to access more or use less energy. And that's that will be the winners going forward. I agree with Damien. I think it's tough to be a battery and, and uh, solar panel supplier and make money, but there are plenty of businesses that will benefit from that lower cost energy. And the, the ones that front run it or that uh, adopt earlier will be the ones that take the, the greatest benefit. Yep, fantastic. Power, the power of the innovators. So mm -hmm. uh, no, very good. So look, present company included. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah. Right, that's certainly the plan. <laughs> Speaking from authority, uh, just just on that. So thank you so much for for joining us today. We have gone um, quite a bit over time, and I know your time's very precious with all the work that you're doing, David. But just um, while we have got you on the line, would you like to share with our audience just ways they can follow your work and um, and track what you've been up to or, yeah, or, or doing going oh, forward? Gosh. Yeah, so feel free. We've got ironmatrix.com. You can visit us in. I, I'm quite active these days on uh, LinkedIn. I often share thoughts there uh, about where I think things are going, what uh, interesting changes that we're seeing. So uh, yeah, more than happy to connect with people through social media. That seems to be an excellent place uh, to, to, to share these ideas. Wonderful. And uh, we'll also drop in a link uh, to your book to Energy Wealthy. Uh, we'll <laughs> put that very in, kind. in the, in the show you. notes as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, would, anyone who's we, interested in hearing more can, can check that one out. Yeah, yeah, we tried it. Well, we priced it for a dollar on Amazon, but uh, you're more than welcome to send us an email and we'll send you a copy. And uh, yeah, let me congratulate you as well, gentlemen, on some fantastic calls in 2020. I, like I said, I follow you uh, every week. Your, your, your insights are absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much uh, for all your excellent work. Oh, you're too kind. No, thanks very much. All right, excellent, mate. We'll, we'll look forward to uh, to getting you on uh, very soon. Hopefully, it doesn't take a full uh, year. I think we worked it out. Three hundred and sixty-three days, so I can set my Not my that timer. You're <laughs> set my timer uh, maybe a little bit sooner than that. So no, uh, thanks again. You're too sweet, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Damien. Very good. Thank uh, and thanks to you, Damien. Uh, the uh, the viewer question of the week we've got. Uh, if you'd like to drop your answers in the in the comments box in uh, in YouTube uh, chat, is do you believe renewables will topple fossil fuels in the next decade? So um, I think uh, if you if you've been paying attention throughout the show, that one's fairly obvious. But uh, it'd be great to get your thoughts and uh, we can check through those uh, a little bit later. Coming up next week, uh, we have founder of Bu a boutique a research firm, Digital Finance Analytics, and host of the popular video blog, Walk the World, Martin North, back on the show. As you may know, if you've been following us uh, or him, Martin's a powerhouse of information in all things Australian property, and he's joining us to share his thoughts on the recent rate cut by the Reserve Bank of Australia, and of course, its potential impacts, along with a special announcement, but that's all I can tell you for now. Uh, so tune in next week, uh, Thursday the 12th of November at 12.30pm as usual for a live chat with Martin North. And of course, head to our YouTube channel, Nucleus Investment Insights, to ask questions along the way. Uh, thanks to all of those who have watched in live uh, for another great episode today. And I hope you've taken away some great ideas. I certainly have. And it sounds like Damien has as well, which is wonderful. Um, we'd like to, uh, of course, if you'd like to see more of our content, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content to stay up to date with news from us. Follow us on our social media. 
And finally, if you know anyone who gets something out of today's episode, let them know about it, share with a friend, and help our show grow. So thanks again for tuning in from myself, Tim Fuller, and the team. And we look forward to catching you at the next one. Cheers.